let's take a look at stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Psychologists have defined attitude in different ways. The traditional three-part definition defines attitude as comprised of thoughts or beliefs, cognition, feelings or evaluations, effect, and tendencies to behave, connection, towards an attitude or object. Regardless of definition, it's widely recognized that stereotypes are mainly cognitive, prejudices are predominantly affective, and discrimination is behavioral. All are important in our interactions in diverse environments. Often, diversity training programs begin by trying to reduce stereotypes on the assumption that this is necessary to reduce prejudice and improve interactions. The intuitive assumption is that stereotypes lead to prejudices, which lead to discriminatory behavior. If that's correct, then it really is necessary to address stereotypes first to reduce prejudice and discrimination. However, research shows that stereotypes and attitudes sometimes lead to behavior. Behavior sometimes leads to new stereotypes or attitudes, and often the two seem independent of each other because of other variables. For example, stereotypes might lead us to behave differently towards a category of people, even though we may not hold prejudices against them. Simply recognizing the category may elicit behaviors strongly associated with that group of people. In other cases, discriminatory behavior results from environmental factors like laws, norms, or others' behavior. The person who's discriminating may have neither strong stereotypic beliefs or prejudicial attitudes. Unpleasant or discriminatory behavior towards others is more likely to be a problem in work organizations than stereotyped thinking or negative feelings alone. It's more efficient and probably more effective to focus diversity management work not on stereotypes, but on changing behavior so that it is respectful, neutral, or positive, and focused on accomplishing the organization's work. A second reason to focus on behavior rather than on stereotypes is that people's beliefs and feelings often change as a result of their behavior. Altering behavior can produce changes in stereotypes and prejudices as well. Stereotypes are categories into which people classify one another on the basis of some defining attribute. First, someone categorizes others based on a noticeable characteristic, the defining attribute, and then learns a set of other characteristics, the associated attributes, thought to apply to people in that category. Once formed, the stereotype filters perceptions and reactions or relations to others who seem to fit the stereotypic category. Stereotypes are a shortcut for applying past learning about people to a new situation. For this reason, they are sometimes useful and socially adaptive. Rather than try to eliminate stereotyping, we should try to understand how stereotypes operate so that we can avoid pitfalls in their use. In using stereotypes, we leave out individualizing information unique to that individual, focusing on a few salient characteristics and assume things about a person on the basis of what we believe about the category. Natural categories such as race, gender, and age are widely used to categorize people. These are broad classifications immediately apparent when we meet someone, useful in capturing socially and behaviorally relevant distinction. Stereotyping is a fundamental and automatic social cognition process, often helpful in making sense of a complicated social reality. Trying to suppress stereotyping may not work and may in fact result in stronger categorical thinking. Activating a stereotype is not the same thing as using it. Given the difficulty of preventing stereotype activation, we can prevent destructive effects by recognizing when stereotypes are aroused and preventing ourselves from acting on them thoughtlessly. Research indicates that under some circumstances, we certainly can. It's useful to discuss why stereotypes are helpful or adaptive and how hard they are to prevent. Rather than trying to influence participants not to stereotype, trainees can be taught ways to recognize when a stereotype has been activated and to control its application through techniques described. Managers, researchers, textbook writers, and others often assume a stereotype is operating when a prejudice or discrimination are observed and that if they were only to stop stereotyping, bad consequences would disappear. 
focusing on stereotypes as the cause of hostility or unfair behavior targets a learned cognitive habit that is difficult or impossible to change, instead of ways to alter undesirable behaviors directly through training or other intervention. Problematic behavior is probably easier to change than stereotypes if they exist. We may even find that stereotypes change after people begin to act differently. Prejudiced feelings may be hard to identify apart from discriminatory behavior. Most recommended strategies do not address prejudice and discrimination separately. Recall that sometimes people behave unfairly not because of prejudice, but due to habit, organizational procedures, or commonly accepted norms. Often, the term discrimination is used when the speaker actually means illegal discrimination, potentially unlawful, differential treatment based on protected category membership, but much discrimination is not illegal. We might take offensive comments, avoid contact, or withhold information. Such behaviors cause distress and interference with inclusion and productivity in organizations. In employee selection, promotion, or compensation, it's important to discriminate, like distinguish, on the basis of knowledge, skill, or ability, or performance justifying an employment decision. In social science, prejudice and discrimination have been extensively studied for many years and found to occur for many reasons. Some say that they tend to change discriminatory behavior in a design strategy addressing the reason for the behavior. Some explanations are framed at the macro level, accounting for hostilities between or among groups in a society, and others at a micro level, addressing why a particular individual shows prejudicial attitudes or discriminatory behavior. Discriminatory behavior as a learned response to environmental events or as a result of information or learning. The implication for diversity professionals is that if the environment created the behavior problem, then changing the environment is probably the way to address it. Prejudice is scapegoating or displacement of hostility from one target and to another. Commonly, interpersonal contact in groups can help improve conflict between members. However, contact does not always reduce intergroup hostility and in fact, sometimes makes it worse. Research has shown that characteristics of contact are important in the quality of subsequent relationships. For the diversity professional, this research is relevant for designing intergroup events as well as analyzing qualities of existing relationships to understand how they might be changed to improve intergroup relationships. Four factors were necessary for intergroup contact to have positive effects. Status contact, shared goals, corporate relations, and support from laws, norms, or authority. Other psychologists emphasize the role of decategorization or weakening of perceived boundaries separating groups. When interaction is successful, a new inclusive sense of group identity develops. Informal activities encouraging cooperation across group boundaries can be very constructive. There are practical reasons to focus training on changing discriminatory behavior. According to social learning theory, behavior change happens through watching the behavior of others. We learn new cues for established behaviors, new behaviors themselves, or consequences that follow from a behavior. In cognitive dissonance theory, unpleasant tension motivates change which is easier for private attitude than public behavior already enacted or supported by other motivations. self perpetuation theory makes the same predictions for prejudice reduction, but without relying on the concept of cognitive dissonance to explain the results. Attitude is merely an interference drawn from observation of one's behavior. These theories have several implications for the diversity professional. When employees see managers or respected peers behaving inclusively towards members of underrepresented groups, they're likely to behave that way as well. To encourage positive attitudes towards others, we should use barely enough influence to get the person to act as if it were their own attitude, preferably publicly. Opportunities for cross-group interaction should be voluntary but expected rather than required. However, in some circumstances, it may be appropriate to require behavior. Legal or safety requirements are two examples. 
For diversity professionals, this work implies that someone induced to interact with the other group members may be motivated to do a good job and thus seek out positive aspects and new information about others. Over time, attitudes towards other group members may change in a positive direction as new relationships are learned and reinforced. We should expect changed attitudes as a result of changed behavior, not as a requirement for it. In work settings, employees' behavior is more critical than their feelings or thoughts.